Good morning, church. Here's some things that are going on at Exeter VFC before we get started with our service today. If you're a first time guest with us, we're really glad that you've joined us. If you haven't stopped by the welcome desk yet downstairs, we wanna make sure to connect with you today. So we'd love for you to take the QR code that's on the card in the seat back in front of you and scan that. And you can fill out an online version of a form that's on the other side of that card. Either way, we want to get that information from you just so that we can connect a little bit better and know that you were here visiting us today. After the service is over, make sure you stop by that welcome desk because we have a gift to give you to say thanks for joining us today. Our annual church family picnic event is just one week away next Sunday, June 23rd. It will be at 11 a.m. So instead of coming at 10 a.m. like you normally would for the Sunday morning worship service, we'd ask you to come at 11. You can bring your Bibles and a lawn chair. We'll be having an outdoor service at that time. And then we'll follow that up immediately with the church picnic. The picnic will take place right outside the doors in between the two main buildings in the grassy area. You'll see a bunch of canopies set up there, so you'll know where to find us. As far as food goes, the church is going to provide hamburgers, hot dogs, chicken, and drinks. We would ask anyone else that plans to attend if they could bring either a side dish or a dessert that can be shared with everyone. We would ask you to sign up ahead of time if you're able to, just so we can get some kind of a head count and know how much food we need to purchase ahead of time. So again, that is next Sunday, June 23rd, and it will be at 11 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. Good morning, Extra Bible Fellowship Church. You may have noticed the church looks a little bit different this week. We're so excited that tomorrow night, our jungle journey kicks off here. Thank you so much to everyone who has donated, um, things from our Amazon wish list and from your home and that have helped with setting up and with preparing all the materials for BBS. We're really excited to kick off tomorrow night. If you have not registered yet, you may still register. You can find the registration on the website or you can find it in the e-bulletin and we are looking forward to seeing you. As a reminder, if your kids are coming, check-in starts at 5.15. And our night officially kicks off at 5.30 and pickup is at 7.45. And on Thursday night, just like last year, if you joined us, we're going to have our family fun night. There's going to be bounce houses, face painting, hot dogs, cotton candy, all sorts of fun activities for the whole family to enjoy. So make sure if your kids are coming to BBS this week that you join us that night as well to see what we've been doing. That's all the announcements that we have for today. There's always more going on and we have a lot of stuff upcoming like BBS this week. So don't forget about that. And we also want to make sure that you check out the information for the Reading Phillies game that's happening in August. If you're interested in going to that game and buying tickets, make sure you read the info in the e-bulletin and speak with Pete and Yvonne because they need money by a specific date in order to get those tickets reserved. One other special thing is that today is Father's Day. So we have a fun video just to showcase our appreciation for all of you dads out there. After the service is over, we also wanna encourage you to make sure to stop by the lower lobby because we have Donuts for Dads Sunday. We brought parenting questions to some of the wisest minds on the planet. You guessed it, dads. This is Ask a Dad. What should I do if my kids won't come when I call them? Turn off the Wi-Fi and watch them all magically appear. Will my children ever let me use the bathroom in peace? Yes, when they move out of your house. When we're playing sports, should I let my kids win? Absolutely not. It's not your fault God bless you with incredible athletic talent. Why is there peanut butter on the back of my couch? Why are there Legos in the fridge? No one knows. What if my kids don't think I'm cool? It doesn't matter, because deep down, all dads know that they are so cool. How come nobody laughs at my amazing dad jokes? Because you're doing it right. Why can't my kids remember to do their chores? Because that part of a child's brain is reserved for remembering all the things you hoped they'd forget. Why won't my children listen to me? What? How do I get my kid to eat dinner? You look them right in the eyes and you tell them you are going to your friend's house for dinner. Problem solved. As a dad, how can I dress for success? 
Two words. Cargo shorts. Sounds like some of the kids want to give their fathers a round of applause. <laughs> just the Burton boys. That's a good sign. It's a great sign. Uh, we'll get started with worship in just a second, but uh, because of the Father's Day stuff and everything, we'll let you guys go ahead and do your meet and greet now before we start with worship. So if you're able, stand and greet your neighbor. Well, good morning again, and once again, happy Father's Day. I hope that um, your families are able to celebrate you properly, whatever that looks like, whether it's not taking a photo at the photo booth downstairs or uh, enjoying some good food with family um, and fellowship. Don't forget about the donuts, which are priority-wise, they're for the dads, so make sure the dads get the donuts first, but you guys can grab those after the service is over. And I wanted to give one more quick just reminder, um, because sometimes it's easy to miss in the announcement video just because... Maybe you're having a conversation or something like that, but I feel like I've got good detention right now. So um, next week is our church picnic, which means for those of you who haven't been here before, we do our service and food. Everything is outside there on the lawn. Unless the weather is bad, if it's raining, then we'll come inside. We'll do the service in here and the food down in the um, gymnasium and cafeteria. But our service and everything starts at 11 a.m. instead of 10 a.m. like it is on a normal Sunday. So just remember that. And everybody who's planning on attending, make sure you bring a side dish or a dessert. But that's a, a really fun thing that we get to do as a church every single year. So hopefully everybody can come out. And um, it's also a low-key way to kind of celebrate the end of VBS, which obviously starts tomorrow. So um, those are my last little plugs. But we're going to go ahead and start with worship. I'm not going to do good, good father with you guys. Um, hopefully you weren't hoping on that. But uh, we kind of did that song a little too much um, a few years ago. But we'll start things with great things as we're not here to celebrate our fathers, but ultimately our uh, heavenly father. And we can recognize everything that he has done, everything he's accomplished as he continues to, to guide us and uh, uh, live through us. Hopefully we can worship him and glorify him with everything that we do. So let's uh, worship together.
time of morning prayer and offering, you may be seated. As the men come forward, please join me as we go before the Lord today. Heavenly Father, your word tells us to enter your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise to give you thanks and to praise your name. So Lord, once again, we just thank you, Lord, for the privilege to assemble ourselves together today in this local church, Lord, to Hear the teaching of your word, to sing your praises, to worship you and the fellowship. And Lord, again, we would just pray for your continued hedge of protection around this local assembly, Lord, this church, its people, its families, its ministries. May you keep evil forces away. And Lord, it's also a special Sunday that we celebrate uh, this time each year, Lord, to honor the fathers that are among us, Lord. And I just uh, just want to pray for the fathers here today, Lord, you be with them in a special way, Lord, especially those that have younger children, Lord, and teens and preteens. Uh, this world is ever more difficult for a young person to grow up in, up in Lord, with so many evil influences that, that are out there, Lord. So I just pray you give it, each of our fathers a, a spirit of wisdom and discernment, Lord, as they strive to teach their children, Lord, right from wrong, truth from error, to guide them in the teachings of your word. And Lord, we also uh, have VBS coming up this week, Lord, starting tomorrow. So again, I would just pray there would be a, a great season of uh, reaching out to our young children, Lord. I just pray that now you would begin preparing the, the hearts and spirits of each and every you know, young child that's going to be here this week, Lord. I just pray that they all enjoy the uh, the crafts and the games, but also, Lord, that they would be attentive to the spiritual things that are going to be taught to them, that their young hearts and minds would begin to uh, be more and more in tune with your word. I just pray it just be a great time of uh, uh, just safety and for everything that's going to be taking place this week for VBS. Lord, I just pray for some of our folks, Lord, dealing with some physical issues, Lord. I do thank you, Lord, for the successful procedure that was done for Alexi Eichelberger, Lord. I just pray you be with her now as she continues to heal and, and recover from some of, some of the pain that she's dealing with, Lord, and you just bring full and complete healing to her. Just pray also, Lord, for uh, Ruth Ann Westwester and the Barb Gaten, Lord, who have just recently had some hospital stays, and I just pray for them now, Lord, as they continue their recovery at home. You bring strength back to their bodies and health. And Lord,
Father, now we just uh, pray for the message that we're about to hear. Lord, just be with Pastor Bill as once again he expounds your word to us. Lord, we speak through him, Lord, your truth to lay upon our hearts, Lord, to just continue to ground us in the truth of your word. And we thank you for the offering that we're about to take up. Again, Lord, I just thank you for the gifts that you have been bringing in. And just give us continued wisdom, Lord, to use these, uh, these offerings, Lord, in a wise, efficient way for the work you want to do through this local church. This is your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. As those containers are being passed, we're going to continue in worship. Um, and if you're able, I'd ask that you stand as these, these next two songs specifically are more of prayers that we can pray into God, um, recognizing not just our need for him, but sometimes the attitude that we uh, place before him, especially in a place like our church on Sunday morning. Um, as we sing these words, I, I pray that uh, you can sing them and mean them, but ultimately pray them and ask that they are the reality of what's in your hearts, that we can say we desire nothing else but God, nothing more than his presence, and that even with our hearts and our attitudes and our preferences, we can leave those at the wayside. Um, so let's, let's seek a little bit of time before the Lord and meditation and humility as we um, pray and sing these things together.
nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, nothing else, oh, nothing else, nothing else will do. worship stay in that mood of this prayer from us to God this hopeful realization that there should be nothing else between us and him not how we feel not the things we experience on a day-to-day -day basis but that we can bring this song and more than just singing these words we can live this out we want to bring him everything we have because it's more than what we do here on Sunday morning Let's sing this together more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper with it through the way things appear you're looking into my heart sing the chorus I'm coming back I'm coming back to the King of Endless Worth. King of Endless Worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Deeper 
Again, we're, we're changing things up um, over the next handful of sermons uh, just because of where we were progressively in 1 Corinthians and children being in the service and uh, some topics that are best handled at home uh, with probably the father and mother than, than from, from the stage with the depth that we needed to go. So we've adjusted and uh, last week Jordan did a phenomenal job on speaking of imitating God. I'm kind of going to even expand a little bit on that today on um, what... What do we get from being a child of God? What is it like to have a heavenly father? And there's truly an infinite amount of uh, different directions that we can go with that, um, going in a very specific direction. And this is the first time I think ever as a pastor or even as when I was a youth pastor or other positions where I taught or something where I actually shifted a good portion of the sermon early this morning. Um, I think and meditate over sermons all week long, especially on a Saturday night. I don't sleep well, and I dream about the sermon. I literally like think about this stuff all night long, and when I wake up, I start thinking of different things, praying, get up early in the morning, and today I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adjust some things just through prayer and, and meditation with the Lord. And so I've kind of adjusted the back half. Um, most of what we're going to focus on is relevant to everybody, but As we continue on the sermon, the context will narrow because today I really do want to focus on fathers um, and and just some things that I've learned as a father. I don't want to be remiss to avoid or ignore this. I've always wanted to be a missionary, to be honest, since getting saved in like a really dangerous, like wild Amazon type place. This is probably the closest I'll get. Um, But hey, this is great. I know Becky and those have done a phenomenal job of decorating this church for VBS, um, especially if you're under four foot six. You don't have to worry about the, the hanging decorations. Um, and so, Lord willing, again, objective here is to bring in different people from the community as well as our own uh, young people and just love on them, show them the love of the Lord, teach them the Bible, uh, and who knows what God's going to do with those seeds planted. And so that's our objective this upcoming week. And thank you to all those who are going to volunteer. Uh, Let's pray as we dive into God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, God, I I say that title at the start of prayers as we're instructed uh, by your son in Matthew, uh, Lord, but I pray familiarity um, is never a common thing for us in the fact that we get to call you our Heavenly Father. What a title. What an honor. The King of Kings, King of the universe, creator of all things allows us to call him his father, our father. Lord, I pray that we would honor you today. I pray that we would honor you at all times. In Jesus' name, amen. So today I'm going to talk about titles. I'm going to cover uh, a multitude of titles. The first uh, being the only one that every pretty much human being uh, carries, and it's not a, it's not a flattering title. Uh, after that, I want to talk about being a child of God because we all have different ways of describing ourselves. I think I've talked about this before. One of the coolest things I ever had was a mentor way back when I first got saved, like six months into being saved, 
Yeah, me and a bunch of other men write out, describe yourself. And not one of me and the other 30 men wrote child of God anywhere in our description. We all wrote about our skills, our, our status, our, our all these things. And he was the only one that actually started with, I'm a child of God. And everything was filtered through that. And that impacted me greatly. And uh, I think especially the way that we live in America, many of us are described or describe ourselves or live through the lens of how we view ourselves. But it ought to start with you're a child of God, if you're actually a child of God, which we're going to talk about. Then as we narrow down to, to fathers, we're going to talk about husbands, fathers, and then last but not least, kind of your job title, if as men you have a job title. So today a lot is going to be focused towards men. Um, but I'm certainly not going to miss everybody. There's context for everybody. You know, as you acquire, if you will, or step into a new title in your life, it really shifts things. It ought to shift, th shift things. It'll change your prioritization. It'll change uh, your, your behavioral patterns, your attitude. All of these things massively change. When you become a Christ follower, the moment you get saved, you should have a 180 degree turn from the lifestyle that you used to have. There ought to be massive behavioral shifts, attitude shifts, and things like that. When you become a husband or a father, all of those things will change your patterns. Back when I was an incredibly arrogant youth pastor, uh, I'm just, I guess I would say, slightly less arrogant these days. When I was a youth pastor, I genuinely thought I knew just about everything. And I remember that I had a dad in one of the youth groups that was a gym teacher, and he used to be in really good shape. And I was 25 at the time, not married, no kids. Uh, and I was in really good shape. You know why? Because I had no other responsibilities. And I remember him talking to me once. We were at the pool in his backyard doing some youth event. And he's like, just wait till you get married and have kids. He's like, you will not have time to stay in shape. And I was like, man, that's just what lazy people say. <laughs> I, I really said that to him. A guy with three kids, a wife, a job. He was a coach at all different kinds of things. He volunteered at school. Me, I was living alone as a youth pastor. I didn't even own a car. I drove a motorcycle. Like, that's how responsible I was. And I'm telling this guy in his late 40s, like, ah, oh, man, that's just because you're lazy. You don't, you, don't, you don't prioritize the time. And then I actually have pictures in my office of a book that they gave me in California when I moved of me at a beach uh, before I got married and, and, and I look like a model from, from, from Hollywood. And then a um, year later after being married, there's like conservation people around me with buckets, like save the whales. And they're surrounding me as I'm laying on a beach towel and I don't know what's going on uh, because I'm massive. And I think that there's just, there's, there's, those, there's those adjustments that happen. When I got married, I realized just how selfish I was with my time. I also realized that women live infinitely different than men. When we got married, I owned a bed, like not a box spring or, a, or anything. I owned a bed, a mattress. Um, i trying to think of what else I had. I, th I didn't have a dresser. I don't know. I think I had a bed. Uh, that's about it. And then all of a sudden, like a year in, the house had like plants and food in the fridge and all, all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and, I, and I had to adjust because we got married when I was 29 years old. I had lived on my own for a long time. So there was massive behavioral pattern changes that I had to change as I became a husband. And a quick example I've said to some of y'all that know me a little bit better before is when I first got married, uh, our executive pastor called me up to the front of the church to introduce my wife. And I tore up to the front of the stage as I was used to doing as a single guy coming up to either preach or do things for youth. And I got up and I turned around and seriously, Sarah's like 15, 16 rows back all by herself, and I'm just standing up there, like, waiting for her to catch up, and to be honest, I feel like that was our marriage for a long time, like, I was used to me as myself, living my own life as a pastor in ministry, I had things to do from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, and she was just an addition that I got around to now and again, and we realized within about a year and a half of marriage, that's not going to work, marriage doesn't work that way, and then I had children, and all of a sudden, where I used to think I was busy and stretched for time, now I had children and my whole world was completely different. And again, anybody that hasn't been in each of those stages truly, truly cannot grasp the mindset change that has to happen for each of them. I can explain what it is to be a dad, right? But unless you're a dad, you, you cannot understand it. 
Uh, you can explain what it is to be a mother, but unless you're a mother, all of these different roles in life, it's impossible to really know until you fill them. And so I want to talk today about how do we honor those titles. I want to talk briefly about some things I see in this world that I'm concerned about with dads. But the heart of the message really is going to be at the beginning, and that's the title, Child of God. There's really two titles that the Bible gives all of humanity, and we see it in 1 John 3, verse 10. We don't have a main text really today. If you, if you would, I think the, the, the deepest part we're going to go into is in Romans 8. So if you want to turn there, that's fine. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of verses on the screen. But 1 John 3.10, John writes this, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Right there we see two titles. You can only fall into one of those two categories in this world. You are either a child of God or a child of the devil. I've had the blessing of these last two or three weeks of actually a little over a dozen. I think we had 13 membership meetings in my office with different people over newer people that have been coming that want to know more about the church, more about doctrines. And as I dive deeply into doctrines, you know, one of the distinctives that we talk about and I say is different from probably our church and most churches, which may not be overt, but we make it very overt here is many churches teach or at least insinuate that you are only sick, that sin really only makes you sick. But we teach, and what the Bible teaches is that you are dead in your trespasses. You are either a child of the Lord or you are a child of the devil. Again, I see two categories given in the Bible and that really, whether you're one or the other, ought to be obvious, depending on the way that you live. It should be obvious according to John. What are some other titles that we see the Bible lays upon those who do not know the Lord? Ephesians 5, 7 through 8, therefore do not be partakers with them, he says, for you were formerly darkness, darkness being a noun. You are darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. So you used to live in darkness. Everything you did was essentially evil. It may not have been as evil as it could have been, but you were living in darkness, but now you are children of light. Walk as children who are in the light. So again, we're stepping out of darkness into light, and there becomes a massive shift because depending on when you get saved, there are behavioral patterns. There's natural living that you got used to doing. Nobody had to teach you how to be a sinner. No one. You were really, really, really good at it from the time you were born. Ask your parents. I say that often. Nobody teaches their children to sin and hide. Children naturally sin and hide. They naturally lie. They naturally say no. They are naturally aggressive when they don't get what they want because within them there is that sin nature. And so when we become children of the Lord, we have to change. Our behavioral patterns ought to change. The problem is, again, a lot of times our attitude or our behaviors don't change. We don't dive into God's word. We don't spend time uh, in prayer. We don't spend time with other believers in order to realize, hey, there's a lot of stuff that God says I shouldn't be living like that I've got to change that I've lived like my whole life. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, some more titles. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Again, there's the behavioral pattern of the world, and you too, before you got saved, that you indulged in the desires of the flesh, that you were sons of disobedience, children of wrath, dead in your sins. That is the title that everyone in the world can relate upon. We have all lived that lifestyle. But, one of the greatest conjunctions in the entire Bible, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What a transition, right? This is what you were, but God saved you through Christ. By grace, you have been saved. One more negative title before we move on. John eight forty four. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He said, you are of your father, 
the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is the liar and the father of lies. So again, that is speaking and acting out from your own nature, and that is what we all were. And all of us have to get rid of that within us. We have these natural inclinations or responses to things that come up in life, and we think that it's proper because it's the way we've always done it. However, we've got to get into God's word because the way we've always lived might be still living out that sinful, fleshly nature. There should be a huge, massive pattern shift in your life, a behavioral shift, a tangible shift if you come to know the Lord. John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Again, there's the old, uh, it's a Christmas song. I don't remember the exact name of it, but it's, it says we're all children of God. I think it's something with sand or something else. But many of us have sung it. Um, I know, I can't think of it off the top of my head. But everybody's, a tr- for we're all a child of God, something like that. We're not. And I hear it all the time that we're all children of God. We're not all children of God. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible does not teach that all of humankind are children of God. They're made in his image, yes, but not all people are children of God. You can be a child of the devil or a child of God. So how do you separate the two? How do you know the difference? It's because of faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus. So again, as we see, as stated, you can be a child of God through faith in Christ, but it is through Christ alone, Christ alone, that you can obtain such a title. You cannot earn it with your own merit. You cannot do enough good deeds. You can only become a child of God by adoption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Listen, in love, he predestined us to what? Adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. You were lost, you were dead, he chose you, he saved you, he adopted you as his child, not on anything that you have done or would do, but for his own intention, according to the kind intention of his will. He has determined this. He is the one who adopts you and makes you his child. What a title. Romans 5, 1 through 2, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. Listen, again, I feel like we can get used to reading things or hearing things. I would really like all of you, especially if you are a true child of God, to pause here, to think for a second. You were a child of darkness. You were a child of wrath, You had earned punishment for the wages of sin is death, correct? You were a child of your father, the devil. Christ rescued you. Christ died on the cross to purchase you with his own blood. Jesus made you a child of God, not based on anything inside of you, just simply because he loves you. You were destined for hell. You deserved hell. And many of you who especially lived a long time in the flesh know exactly what type of person you were. We would be afraid to speak of such things publicly, and he saved us. I pray we never get used to that. I pray that's never just a common, like, yeah, I'm his. What it cost for him to get you, we will never fully fathom but we are his, and what are we to do as his? What an, what an honor 
This set of verses, we're going to spend a short period of time. I guess I could have had you turn here because Galatians and Romans is kind of what I really want to focus on. Galatians 4, verses 1 through 7. Paul writes, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Prior to this, in Galatians 3, Paul is writing how we are all slaves to sin. We are slaves to the law. Proof, the law proves that we cannot do anything good in and of ourselves. God gave them rules and they could not keep them. He gave them those rules to show them that they could not keep them. They could not earn righteousness on their own. They were slaves to the elemental principles of the world. Again, in Galatians 3.22, Paul writes that all, all of humanity has been shut up under sin. All of humanity has been shut up under sin. We are slaves to sin. And yet, as we see here in Galatians 1 through 7, yes, you You are a child who was chosen before time, but before he actually saved you, before that moment you became saved, you were a slave to sin. There's a very strong historical context here because there's something in Roman culture during that time, it was called a liberalia. A liberalia is a time where a father would determine his son has now become a man. This usually happened between the age of 15 to 18. It was a massive deal. They threw a huge party, and the father actually at that point would say, they would take an old toe guide, I don't know Latin. In fact, I literally got an F in Latin in ninth grade. But they would take this, they would take this toga, and they would exchange it for a new toga, and it is the first time that the father is actually saying this is my son. This is my acknowledged son and heir. And the word for it was adoption. Jewish culture really had no idea of adoption. Adoption is talked about a lot in the New Testament, but those Romans knew a lot about adoption. A father determined he knew his child well enough to say they have reached the age where they are now a man and they are an heir of mine. If I pass away, they take on everything. They gain the household, the the family name, they gain all of these things. And within Roman culture, there are, doc- there are a lot of documents of fathers whose sons did not possess specific skills or qualities that the father was looking for. So again, it was a colder culture. What they did is they actually went out and, and tried to find young men who did fit the skills and qualities that the father was looking for. And the father would actually adopt that child. That child would take on the family name and they would be at just the same as if they were born under that father's household and they took on everything. They became the heir of everything, the recipient of everything. And according to the law, that instantly, in that immediate instant, made that child the heir to the father. Anything the father had now belonged to to that child. Adopted or legitimate, that child legally became the father's property forever. And that is the kind of language that Paul is talking about in Galatians Galatians 4. You were a slave to sin. You were held in bondage to that, but Christ set you free, and now you are his. Not only are you his, but he gives you his Holy Spirit, which allows you to cry out, Abba, Father, Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption. As sons by which we cry out, Abba, 
Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. We are heirs to the kingdom of God, to the throne. I mean, we went from at enmity with God to being an heir to all that he has. Enemy to child. And as his child, Jordan talked last week about we are to imitate him, but guess what? As his child, we can come to him with anything and everything. We can come with normal everyday requests for he is our father, but also we can come to him with our deepest cries, with our deepest needs. What I don't wanna do and what I'm about to explain is have you lose the impact here that Paul does choose to use a specific word here. In Hebrew and Aramaic, Abba does mean father. It means papa, it means daddy. I've seen that abused. There really is a different emphasis here. There is something specific that he's talking about here. So I wanna spend a second. Is he your papa? Is he your daddy? Yes, that is the technical term and you are his child and you can love him that way. However, the way I've heard these verses presented and used a lot is in in a reverent context of, oh, papa, oh, daddy. That is not really what Paul is saying at all. We know this for certain, one, because of the reverence he had for the Lord, but two, because of the Greek word that he uses prior to this. It's a Greek word called kradzo. Kradzo. It means to croak or cry with a loud, harsh, and disturbing voice. Listen, to croak or cry with a loud, harsh, and disturbing voice. Kradzo is kind of like an English, like squeak or squeal or boom. You can like feel it within the word itself. Kradzo, it's this, it's this guttural, something's wrong. So when you're crying out to him, it's this deep, desperate cry for your, for your father. That's what Paul is talking about. You were lost, you were an evil sinner, yet he adopted you that you can cry out to him and he will save you. He will hear you. That Greek word kradzo, I really want us to understand this, is used in multiple spots throughout the New Testament. Let me give you some other contexts. Luke 19, 40, Jesus is speaking, he says, and he, and he answered and said, I tell you that if these become silent, if his people become silent, the stones will cry out. That cry out is kradzo that the world would scream out that he is the king. Revelation 12, 2 ought to give you a really good idea of what that word means. And she was with child and she cried out, being in labor, in pain, to give birth. That cried out, that labor pains as a woman screams in pain, that is that word, kradzo, that is that screaming out. Acts seven fifty seven. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and they rushed upon him with one impulse as they're killing Stephen. They're hearing what they don't wanna hear and the mob starts screaming and covering their ears in such a guttural, disgusting scream. They just start screaming and charge him and murder him. It's that kind of emotional, deep scream. We see it one more time, Matthew 27, 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. When Jesus Christ cried on the, or died on the cross, as he cried out, it's that same Greek word. It was that kind of crying out to his father. That is what Paul says we get to do with our children, or with our, with our father, that we are his children. We get to cry out like that. He invites us to come with, to him with our daily needs, our deepest needs. I wanna talk on that crying out in a deeper way here in a second. So shelf that for a second, that deep cry. 
What does the Bible teach us on our daily needs? We get to come to him on our daily needs. Matthew 6, 7 through 13. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition. I always have to pause here because I've never understood within the Catholic Church, there's, there's a lot that still I'd say within Catholicism, um, Protestants ought to pick back up on uh, learning things and, and confession, not in the same light, I, not sitting in a confessional or things like that. Again, I don't think Christians are very good at confessing their sins to one another. Uh, but I've never understood, especially in the Catholic Church, the, the way that they repeat the Lord's Prayer when literally Jesus started with, don't use meaningless repetition. It just, it just is insane to me. Uh, but he says, as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Also, j- just again, a reminder of like, you 30, 45 minute public prayers, don't do it. It's okay. It's okay to have a, a short prayer. Jesus himself says you're not gonna be heard just because of the repetition of your words, right? Just because it's a great grand prayer doesn't mean the Lord is more likely to hear Abba Father as a long drawn out printed prayer that you read eight pages of. We've all been a part of those, right? Our high school graduation had one of those prayers. It was like 15 minutes into his closing prayer and everybody's like, come on, dude. Close it, right? Like, that doesn't equal piety. Long words doesn't equal piety. Sometimes the Lord just wants a guttural, heartfelt, Father, help me. I talked about that, I think, before when our son was very sick and I was talking to one of my professors and when some tragedy happened in his family, he said for months, for months, all he could say was the name of Jesus. He was in so much hurt. All he could do was whisper the name of Jesus because he was so hurt. God, our Father, heard that prayer. But he says, therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray then in this way, our Father. You know what it means? I mean, especially him talking to a Jewish audience that you could call God your Father. I mean, they want to stone him off of that alone, the irreverence there. But it's truth. It's a true relationship that Jesus has with the Father in a unique way, but that he has invited us into as well that we are allowed to go before the throne of the king of the universe and say, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Again, there's that reminder. Yes, you're our father, but hallowed be thy name. Reverent be your name. You're you're holy. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not lead us into temptation But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As a quick side note for Bible students and scholars, I always like to give you tools as you study the word of God. If you have a version of the Bible that has those brackets, again, brackets typically mean those are not found in some of the earliest uh, the transcripts. Won't get like super geeked out on this, but... Uh, there's different transcripts that don't specifically have that. If you see parentheticals, it's an actual in the Greek parenthetical where they're giving you a side note. But some of your versions may not have that added part at the end of verse 13. So if you see brackets, it's because some old transcripts have this added line and some do not, and scholars debate on whether it should go into the Bible or not. So I just wanted to put that up there. But to get back on course, you can go to your heavenly father with literally every part of your daily needs. We could probably spend the rest of our lives breaking down this prayer and how it ought to impact our daily lives and the fact that we can go to our heavenly Father and ask for anything we need. I mean, how much of us spend time worrying about the things covered in this prayer, right? I mean, we're talking about relationships in here, forgiving others, how hard is that? And how many, how much time and effort do we we spend on that or being concerned of others forgiving us? How about our daily needs? I mean, come on, we're consumed with what might happen tomorrow, with what might happen a month from now, a year from now. God says, I've got this. I'm your father. You're my child. And listen to Hebrews eleven six. 6, so we can make a connection here. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Do you know that God the Father rewards you literally every single time you come to him in prayer? See, the problem we have 
is that we categorize things as God's answered and unanswered prayers. And I often hear conversations about God's answered and unanswered prayers. And listen, I, I want to be fair here. I understand the premise behind these types of phrases. And I'll be honest, I've used them myself. But technically speaking, there is literally no such thing as an unanswered prayer. There is no such thing as an unanswered prayer. The very fact that we have a heavenly father who loves us and hears us is our benefit, is our reward, is our answer to prayer. We have a heavenly father who hears everything we bring to him. He takes all of our petitions, our requests, our praises, all of it. He takes it seriously. He takes it to heart. We give everything over to him. We don't have to worry about results in the categorized answered or unanswered prayers. We've given it to the king of kings. That in and of itself is the blessing, the reward of those who seek him. Sure, we care about the outcomes of prayers. Let's not negate that. But the very fact that we have a God that we can go to is enough. So again, that word crying out, I did some digging because I remember, and I hate when I can't remember the page number or, or the, the author of a book where I read it, and I spent too much time trying to find it. But I do remember reading a book in the 1800s of a missionary who had gone to an orphanage. And some of you have heard this. This story has been repeated in different contexts, but also proven because back before there's what we call ethics in research, they were allowed to do certain things that you can't these days because they found out this probably isn't the best thing that we, there may be long-term effects in testing these things. But there was research done into this specifically, but a lot of it launched maybe from the story of this gentleman in the 1800s who was a missionary and went into an orphanage in a foreign country and he walked into this orphanage and they had literally hundreds of children in this orphanage. And he said he was overwhelmed because he stood in this orphanage with these children in these cribs everywhere. And you know what he said the most overwhelming thing was? Silence. Pure and utter silence. And he asked these ladies who oversaw the orphanage, why is it so silent? And they said, typically within the first few days, children stop crying because they know nobody's coming. Somebody did research on this, and it's called the crying curve. That typically within a week, and almost never longer than a week, do children cry again if nobody comes. That is why children cry. It doesn't matter what they need. They, if you've ever had children, sometimes you try to figure it out. Is it milk? Is it sleep? Is it what? Most of the time, you know what the child wants? To be held to know that there's somebody out there that's gonna take care of them. And children instinctively, after about a week, some earlier, very, very few, a little bit later, just straight up don't cry. They sit there in their hunger, their sadness, their, their mess when they go to the bathroom, and they stop crying because they know nobody's coming. Do you realize the context here? If you get to cry to your heavenly father, Abba, Father, he hears you. Yeah, you may not get exactly what you wanted, but he hears you. He's listening. We can go to him with all our needs, our requests, our fears, everything. He's got it. We should leave them there. Again, how he handles them is up to him but know that we have a heavenly father who gives us an audience. He's listening. He is never ignoring you, especially in your deepest prayers. When I hear my children cry, right? Any parent, you learn your children's noises. You learn them over the years. You learn your spouse's noises. Again, I will never, ever, ever forget when my wife found Nathaniel on the couch completely non-responsive. And when she called me, it was, I've never heard my wife say my name like that before. It was drop everything, run through walls to get to her. There are times when your children get hurt 
And you know when they stub their toe. Yesterday, Nathaniel got stung by a bee. I mean, he handled like a champ. He's a tough kid. He broke his finger this year, and he's like, yeah, look, I broke my finger. Tough kid, right? But there's also those times when your kid gets hurt, and you hear there's something in that, that cry, that, that guttural, you know something's wrong. And there's nothing that's going to stop you from getting to them. That's that Greek word, kredzo. That is what you get to call out to the king of kings. Do you think there's anything that's going to stop the king of kings for you? There is nothing that he would not do for you. Again, we know that he is handling it, and he is handling it properly. Please hear me. It may not be the way you want it to be handled, but he's handling it. He's handling it perfectly. Listen to Romans 8 under this context. Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those according, called according to his purpose. We could stop there, but let me go on. We know that he's causing all things to work together for good. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these also he called. And whom he called, these also he justified. And whom he justified, these also he glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? That is the golden chain. But listen to this verse. This is, to me, one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? What's the Lord saying through Paul here? He sent you his son. His son gave up his position in the Godhead. He submitted himself to God the Father, took on flesh so that he could live a human life to die for you, to feel all of the pain and anguish and the wrath of God that you deserve. He took so that you wouldn't have to. God who sent him, do you think he's going to give you his son and all of that and not freely give you everything else you could ever possibly need? He's given you his son. He doesn't have to prove anything else. He has given you everything you will ever need. If he's given you him, then know when you go to him, whatever you need, he's properly supplying it because he's already supplied his son. Again, you may not feel it tangibly the way you think you ought to. He may not reverse that cancer. He may not save that child. That pregnancy may not come to fruition. Your child may not st stop doing drugs or being a homosexual or all of the different things that happen out there, but he is still the king of kings. He is still on the throne and he knows what he is doing and it is perfect. That is the promise we get. And when we go to him, when we cry out to him, but father, it hurts, my, it's my child. Save them, heal them. He knows the hurt. His son experienced your hurt. He knows it intimately. He loves you. He is responding even if it's not the way that you think. Your voices are not casting out into the void. He has given you his spirit and when you cry, Abba, Father, like I would bust through a wall for my kids, he hears you. He's there. He's got you. Child of God. What? What a title. Father's Day. Y'all want to celebrate something today. Celebrate our heavenly father who has made you his child through the blood of his own son. Amen. I mean, let's stop there, right? Forget the rest of the practical stuff. If he has given us his son, will he not give us everything else we need or withhold that which we do not need. He's demonstrated his love towards us in the gift of his son. Again, if he gave us that perfect of a gift, he will be faithful in all other requests, even if we don't see or agree with it. He is handling it so that you will be conformed to the image of his son so that he will get the glory, which is the greatest thing in the universe when God receives glory.
We see all of that in Romans 8. I mean, we could truly spend our lives in Romans 8. What a beautiful, gorgeous set of verses. I know it doesn't always feel like that, guys. I know it doesn't. But God cannot lie, and his promise is that he's working it out for good. And if he gave you his son, he's not holding back anything else good from you either. His love is perfect. He is a heavenly father. If we as earthly fathers know how to give our gifts, give our children gifts, how much more him? And sometimes he withholds them because he loves us. So again, that was the, the heart and the thrust of where I wanted to go this morning, but let's, let's shift gears and give some practical stuff for, for us men in here. So ladies, again, I know that was kind of a heavy emotional. You can sit in that, spend some time in prayer, but I want to talk to the men here for a second, though. This is applicable to all people. Men, this ought to be your first and most significant title you hold in this world. Child of God. Christ follower. It ought to dictate everything you do in your life. There shouldn't be times you act Christ-like and times you don't. Times that you are going to be like a Christian and times you're not. Every aspect of your life ought to be filtered through God's word that you are a Christ follower. That you are to reflect the Son. You are to be conformed to his image. Everything we do, men, ought to be under that auspice that I am a child of God. Second, men, your most, entit- your most important title for those that it is applicable is husband. When you wake up in the morning and you are a Christ follower, you know what you ought to do. Be a Christ follower in everything. Number two, you ought to filter your decisions through being a husband. Don't be selfish, being a husband. Husbands, as you take on that role, it is quite the calling. Husbands, love your wives, Ephesians 5, 25 through 29. Just as Christ also loved the church. And how did Christ live for the church? Self-sacrificially every single day until he gave up his life. Which is what Paul says, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Why? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present himself to the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Men, you want to be a man cherish and nourish your wife sanctify her in god's word live for her honor her listen don't ask my wife how i do in that right this is for y'all this ain't about me no right it's hard it's hard but what a calling and we took on that role be that be the husband that god called you to be we complain i was complaining this morning not about anything about you. <clears throat> Who's that? Sean. So, no, I was talking about Father Day, some other things, right? We can complain. We can be quick to complain. You know what I signed up for? And I knew these verses when I got married. That would give my life for my wife. Again, we've talked about this before. Listen, somebody comes in with a gun and they start shooting. You think I'm going to cover my wife in a heartbeat? Actually, I'm going to be like more go that way and I'm going to charge the guy, right? Like that's, that's a momentary decision. How about day to day? Taking out the trash, doing things without being asked, just genuinely caring for her, elevating her, loving her, treating her well in my mind, in my heart, with my mouth, with my words. Do I lift her up? Do I tear her down? Just about a week ago, she said something to me that has stuck. She said, you've been really rough to me lately. The smallest little thing, and man, did it stick. I thought my critiques were just correcting them some things, but I was not doing it proper, right? Maybe I'll write it in a kind card or something, but I, I, I'm rough. I can be rough. The heart is to love, but I can be rough, and I need to learn because I want to do it my way. I want to run things my way. God has blessed me with an amazing, awesome wife and a beautiful life through his son. 
And I ought to honor her as a daughter of the king. And men, as a husband, you better take that title seriously. Third, and yes, third, it falls below being a husband. Be a father. There are many things we are called to do and not to do. I can't cover them all. We'll cover two things quickly. Ephesians 6, 4, and fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Listen, the Lord knows you, men. It's easy to do. We're quick to anger, and it's easy to stir up your kids to anger. It's not the way it ought to be. It says what? Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Men, discipline your children. Discipline your children. Don't get angry at your children and never discipline in anger as I have attempted to learn because then you're just, you're trying to get something. You're, you're acting in revenge. Discipline is corrective. It's instructive. But men, what are you to do with your children? instruct them. Colossians 3, 21, fathers, do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. Again, twice, we are warned, dads, be careful how you handle your children because, dad, your wounds can carry for a lifetime. When you beat those children down consistently, I'm not talking physical, of course, there's that. But emotionally, those, those words, sometimes said out of anger, become titles that those children wear the rest of their lives. Be careful, men. Do not provoke your children. Do not exasperate them, but discipline them. Instruct them. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 15, we're not going to go through it, but you want to know how to raise your children? Go to Deuteronomy 6. Teach them God's word. Teach in the way that you live, in the way that you interact with your wife and the world and them, as well as actual direct instruction through prayer and God's word. Teach your kids. Again, Proverbs 1, 1 through 7 would be a great set of verses. Men, if you are new to fatherhood, expect to be a father at some point. Deuteronomy 6 and Proverbs 1 ought to be places you spend a lot of time in because it talks about wisdom and instruction and how to properly instruct others. Here is something I'm going to cover just because I think it's relevant to our current culture. Men, don't be your kid's best friend. You have a way greater calling. Be their father. It is an infinitely higher calling than to be their best friend. There is an example, we're not going to dive into it, in 1 Samuel 2. It's very weird the way the narrative reads in 1 Samuel 2 because there's all of this stuff going on and then it suddenly jumps to zooming in on Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, who's the priest, and how that they're living awful. Then it jumps back to like Samuel in, in, um, in the temple, and then it jumps back again to Hophni and Phinehas and how the Lord is going to kill them. And then it jumps back to like continuing the story. And there's these two spots. It's just really weird that there's this story that's flowing. And all of a sudden, the author jumps in and says, but there's Hophni and Phinehas. Samuel's being raised in the admonition of the Lord and serving the Lord. And the story's going that way. And then it just throws in these other two who are the sons of priests that are living the opposite. And I believe that God does this for a specific reason. Because Eli wanted to be his kids' friends. And they come to him, and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are, are not living the way that the Lord called them to. And the whole nation's telling him, listen, your sons are living in total disobedience. And Eli's like, yeah, my kids. You know how Hophni and Phinehas are. The Lord kills them because of it. I mean, directly it says the Lord kills them because of the way that they're handling their priestly duties. And their father treats them like a best friend, knows what they are doing that is wrong, but doesn't want to confront it. But later, Samuel, who doesn't have any children, but he's the priest, he's the judge, really, of the nation. He's the prophet of the nation. He says this, listen, Dad, do you want to know how? Compare Eli and Samuel, who are the same, going back and forth, the same priests here in Samuel. This is what Samuel says. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. 
Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. Dads, you want some marching orders. Pray for your kids. Instruct them in the good and right way. Teach them to fear the Lord and to serve him with all their heart and to consider all the good things he's done for them. He's saying this while they're pushing back. And he's like, listen, I'm not gonna change. Y'all can push back, but the right thing is I instruct you in the way of the Lord. That I discipline you and you, you when you step out and I love you enough to tell you truth. That's, dad, that's what your calling is. Love the Lord first and love your children through that. Don't try to be their best friends, parents. I was with a friend recently who was telling me about their 16-year-old. And we were all joking and he was talking about how uh, it could be that they would have grandkids soon because he had grandkids young. And one of the other guys was like, yeah, you know, your son has a girlfriend. And he said this as dead serious as could be and claims to be a Christian. Looked at all of us and said, don't worry, my son's girlfriend's on the pill. This guy who claims to be a Christian, 16-year-old son, he's like, you know, it's all good. And the way he talks about his son, it's all this, he's my best bud, he's this, he's that's not being a father. That's not being a father. That's the way the world tries to teach you to be a parent. That is not the way God's word teaches you to be a parent. Instruct them, discipline them, love them, teach them to love the Lord and seek him with all of their heart and especially instruct them by living it out yourself. The final thing is that we will close on this. There's one more title, men, that you will have in this life that to be honest, for the most part, means diddly squat, and that's whatever job you hold. Jobs matter because they provide for you and your family, and you can honor the Lord, but you can honor the Lord in whatever you do. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So men, we live in a society that's all about status and all about your job title. It's one of the first things any American men ever talk to each other about. What do you do? And we live or die by what we do. We think that makes us something, whatever job we hold. And a lot of men out there, they held a job before they got married, and so they still prioritize that job over their wife and over their children. Listen, God gave you that job to provide for that wife and that child. Do not let a job prioritize those things. When you wake up in the morning, you know you're supposed to be a Christ follower, a husband, and a father. As far as what job you're supposed to have, you can serve the Lord anywhere. You can serve the Lord making an income no matter what you do. And so do not let those things interfere. Do not let any of those take the place of others. For those young men that aren't married yet, if you're looking for a spouse, as soon as that relationship impedes with your relationship with the Lord, you know that's not the right girl. Same with the girls. If the guy's trying to get you to do things or, or whatever, you know what I'm saying. Before you're married, guess what? That's not the right guy. That's not the one you want as your husband because he's gonna be all about himself the rest of your marriage as well. Put God first. If you are married, put your spouse second. And if you have children, put them third. And don't idolize your children. Don't let them run your household. Don't let them run your decisions. You run that household, men. Be men. It's not chauvinist. It is not evil. It is God's hierarchy. Be a man. Lead your house. Be strong. Love the Lord. And go to work. Get a job. Work hard and use that to provide for your family, not as an escape from your family. Because that is common in this world as well. Dads, happy Father's Day. Lord, I pray that you all today felt truly what it is to be a child of God. I mean, happy Father's Day. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be your children. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we get to come to you as beloved children. Lord, the promises that come with that for eternity are mind-boggling. But Lord, the impact for every moment, you love us. When we cry, it doesn't go into nothing, Lord. You come running. You hear our every cry as 
our Father as our loving Father who sent his Son to die on the cross for us. You have given us all that we need through your Son. Lord, thank you for the gift that he is. Thank you for the title, child of God. May we live that out. May we love you properly and grow in our relationship with you that was purchased at so great a price. Lord, thank you for the men in this room, those that uh, you have bestowed the title of Father. May we take that title seriously. May we live that out well for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close in response with the hymn, To God Be the Glory, stand if you're able as we sing. And I truly and genuinely pray and have been praying that we would all walk out of here with a new <clears throat> or at least reinforced desire and love for the Father. What an awesome Heavenly Father. What a perfect Heavenly Father we have. Hears our cries and provides and supplies our daily needs through His Son. Let's close with the Aaronic benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Dismissed.